Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, very good evening. I'm Yuvraj Kalia from Rajiv Gandhi Institute for Contemporary Studies. Uh, today's uh, uh, panel discussion is on the topic of agriculture transformation in India, uh, creating farmer-friendly value chains. As a prequel to this discussion, we have had uh, a discussion on uh, agriculture transformation in India. How do we take uh, agriculture in India from an increased a production ecosystem to a sustainable productivity regime and the outcome of that discussion is that yes we have the majority of our farmers are small and marginal and taking uh, taking them to a path of more sustainable uh, both economically and environmentally a sustainable agriculture uh, needs to bring them to uh, uh, you know a benefit of value chain that that is being accrued by many processes and uh, marketers and does the current uh, you know, marketing markets uh, support that tran uh, transformation or not? So today's topic will be, how do we create uh, farmer-friendly uh, value chains? And we have very exciting uh, and very esteemed panel here uh, today with us. We have uh, Professor Sukpal Singh from IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, uh, Professor Sukpal Singh is a uh, agriculture economist he also heads the Center for Management in Agriculture at uh, IIM Ahmedabad. He has led and been a part of various state and central level expert committees on agriculture. Welcome, uh, Professor. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. P.S. Jayakumar, who is the former MD and CEO of Bank of Baroda. Uh, Mr. Jayakumar is a global business and management expert with an outstanding career in banking. At Bank of Baroda, he oversaw much Roy Jay and, and Dena Banks, and he has been uh, engaged with uh, farmer producer companies uh, recently. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Jayakumar. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Rajesh Sena, who is the former MD CEO of NCDEX eMark Limited. Mr. Sena is a recognized thought leader in commodity markets and exchanges and regularly contributes on economic policy, trade, food and agribusiness, and rural development. He is an alumnus of Irma, Gujarat and has been pivotal in creating uh, you know, uh, India's first state agriculture market in Karnataka. Uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Sena. Thank you. We have, uh, uh, last but not least, we have Mr. Sanjay Asthana, who is the CEO of Ruchi Soya Industries, one of the largest uh, food processors in India, and also India's largest producer of edible oils. Apart from serving, from, serving on boards of Indusind Bank and Napcons, he's asso associated with reputed international think tanks. And he's also the chairperson of Agriculture Skill Council of India. Uh, Mr. Sana has a long career in leadership positions in top industries like ITC, Britannia, Alliance Retail, et cetera. Uh, uh, welcome, Mr. Sana. Uh, look forward to hearing from uh, everyone. Um, uh, meanwhile, I'll request uh, participants uh, to whatever questions, if they have, uh, during the discussion, they can put it in the chat box and they'll be taken up uh, towards the end. We have half an hour for discussions and question answers. Uh, before that, uh, each, I would request each panelist to please, uh, you know, try and limit uh, their presentation to about 10 minutes and the question and questions and discussions will be taken later. So without uh, further ado, I'll request uh, Professor Supal Singh to open the discussion and give us an idea into uh, the kind of transformation that we are talking about from, you know, increased production to, you know, a production surplus country that we are current, that we currently have. How do we bring uh, uh, farmers and make them a valuable part of the uh, value chain? Uh, Professor Zakpar, over to you, sir. Thank you, Yubraj. Uh, I didn't know you'll hand over so quickly to me. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's a good surprise. So let me thank the Rajiv Gandhi Institute for uh, Contemporary Studies and uh, also uh, Vijay in person uh, for ma making it part of this uh, uh, panel. Uh, now, when I uh, looked at the uh, topic of the panel discussion of the webinar, I had some questions which came to mind. So I would start with that and then maybe um, spend a few minutes on um, looking at the whole uh, scenario. And then if time permits, I'll talk about the recent uh, agri-market reforms also. Uh, 
So that's why I put a question mark on creating farmer friendly value chains. Uh, now I, I heard this term for the first time to be frank. Yeah. Earlier we have had Niti Ayog's farmer friendly agriculture market reforms index. And then also uh, I came across Karnataka's agricultural marketing policy of 2013, which talks about farmer friendly agricultural markets. Uh, otherwise, I'm not come across this this term in literature. So I, I'm really curious to know how, how we are talking about this kind of thing today. Uh, we have heard of gentlemen's agreements in contract farming or, or, or direct sourcing or procurement. And some Indian companies talk of what they call relationship farming. They don't want to call it contract farming. They say we are into relationship farming with farmers. So that kind of terminology has been there. But when we say farmer friendly value chains, uh, I have my own questions about it. One is that which farmers are we talking about? Yeah. The, the second is how do we define a, a, a farmer friendly value chain? Are we talking about pro poor value chains in some different way? Are we talking only about efficiency? Or also we're talking about the inclusiveness and effectiveness of these engagements of small farmers with modern value. Uh, creators and value chain players? Or are we talking about the same thing differently? We are talking about sustainable value chains, whether organic or fair trade or ethical trade or responsible trade. And now we want to call them from farmer friendly rather than sustainable value chains. Yeah. My question, big question here is, can value chain ever be farmer friendly? Yeah. Can we look for friends in business? Yeah. That too, when farmer is a supplier and somebody on the other party uh, side is a buyer. So can there be really friendships in, in, in uh, business relationships? Yeah. Uh, there's only one scenario where I see uh, chains can be farmer friendly or can be pro farmer. If we have some control of the value chain, not necessarily ownership, control of the value chain brought in the hands of farmers. Or if we have market pressures created, that chain drivers are compelled to respond to farmer requirements and therefore be a little more uh, sort of uh, good to farmers. Yeah. In fact, FAO, after all this uh, decades and years of existence, today talks about what is called uh, responsible contract farming. That everybody recognizes that things have not gone right in the agribusiness sector in terms of corporate engagements with small farmers in particular in the developing world or almost everywhere in general. So the FAO has to now talk about not just contract farming as a tool to remove poverty or to help small farmers or create better linkage, but a responsible contract farming. That we don't behave when we are dealing with small farmers, then we are creating more problems rather than solving some of the existing problems. I would like to start with this, the sharing of some experience of Indian contract farming or contract farming in India, that the way we have conducted contract farming in this country, that, that tells us why we need to talk about different kinds of value chain arrangements with farmers. Uh, there, there's so much about policy uh, in contract farming today, but I would just talk about the practice right now, which will be perhaps more insightful than. Now, if we farmers face two types of risk, production risk and market risk, very rarely, the production risk is shared by the contracting agency uh, uh, with the farmers. The prices still are market driven in some sense, open market driven, not necessarily that contract prices are discovered by the agencies on their own or in negotiation with farmers. So the, so the whole question of what is fair price, even if we talk about, uh, before we talk about farmer friendly chains, if we talk about just fairness in these in the arrangements or this, this pricing mechanisms, what is fair price for the primary grower is still a question. It remains. It is not addressed in any tangible way. Yeah. Then the, look at the contracts. Because until uh, recently, we didn't have any, any tangible uh, regulation on the ground. Even today, I would say it's all on paper. Whatever central acts we are talking about or state APMC acts, which had provision for contract farming, all that has been put on paper. But on the ground, if you look at the contracts being practiced for the last at least 25 years, I have been looking at it. It's highly one-sided. If the, the, if the thing is not good on paper, 
how can it be better on ground? Yeah, it has no chance. So the contracts are highly uh, favoring the company in trust, protecting all its interests, but totally uh, ignorant or not aligned in any way with the farmer's interest, whether production risk or market risk. More importantly, in India, by and large, except one or two specific crops in specific locations, contract farming has excluded small farmers. I, I say it all the time. I, I can still sort of challenge people that show me a farmer uh, who is less than five acre operated and has been part of contract farming arrangements, unless it is mediated by a farmer producer organization or some other NGO and so on. Even state agency like Mark Fed in Punjab, by design, exclude small farmers from their contract farming arrangements. Of course, Nestle has to do it because, because the transaction cost logic. The more important part is that if you're talking about farmer-friendly arrangements in value chains, what does the interface of corporates lead to in terms of the overall uh, scenario in the agricultural context? For example, in India, contract farming has been increasingly leading to perpetuation of reverse tenancy, where the actual control of farm lands, whatever small farmers, medium farmers we may have, Increasingly, the control is moving out of the marginal and small farmers' hand to the medium and large farmers' hand because companies prefer larger contract farmers who cannot own land because of ceilings on land holdings. Leasing is also not permitted, but informally they lease. So today I know farmers in this country who own only two and a half acres their own land, but they run contract farming operations on hundreds of acres of each or dozens of acres of each. Yeah. So that is the larger implication, implication we have to keep in mind if we're talking farmer friendly, farmer friendly for the contract farmer or for the farmer who has leased out his or her land. I would not even go to the larger issue though. If we treat the agricultural worker also as a farmer, as the Swami Nathan Commission had done, as Punjab's Farmer Commission has also defined uh, a farmer today, if you're talking about them also as farmers, not just workers, then there are even many, many larger issues. I will not go into uh, details of that right now. But to me, the major issues in the agriculture sector of this country today, if you're looking at it from value chain perspective, are that I believe and I can prove it that farm size is not an issue. Yeah, so far as the efficiency of production is concerned, farm size is not an issue, yeah? The issue is how do we reduce or manage farmers' production risk and market risk? Yeah, and there things are not improving at all. We had great hopes from Prime Minister uh, uh, Fasal Bima Jojana, and now we are back to square one, uh, square, square one uh, next year because it is made voluntary now, dealing from credit. On the market risk, we, we have all kinds of issues, even MSP not being available to most of the farmers in most of the crops in most of the places. Yeah and you are seeing some of the implications of that kind of arrangements now. Uh, the problem is that farmers are trying to fend for themselves. We don't have enough platforms for small farmers to come together. There is interlocking of produce and credit and interlocking of produce and input markets or credit and input markets. For example, it is shocking to some of us uh, who, who are talking about uh, modern value chains that there is a state in this country where when a farmer sells her produce, she is not paid even by the FCI directly. Her money is paid to somebody else in somebody else's name, despite the state procuring the produce from that farmer. That is the level of uh, maltreatment, I would call it, being given to small farmers in this country in the age of modern value chains. Yeah, I think that, that says everything about what is wrong with our policy and practice on the ground in terms of market interface of small and marginal farmers. I want to highlight a few uh, issues here because unless we set this right, we cannot be locating appropriate role for value chains in the agribusiness sector. One is this outdated methodology of measuring farmer benefit, saying what is producer share in consumer's rupee? Yeah, today when we're talking in the age of products and brands in agribusiness, we cannot be expecting very high share for the farmer in the consumer rupee. 
somebody says he gets only 25 somebody says 40% somebody is 50% somebody says no no he should get 80% that's be very clear that as long as there are multiple stakeholders in a value chain a farmer cannot expect to get a very high percentage of the value created or value extracted or value realized unless and until these chains are controlled by the farmer interests yeah the second is this whole fad about value addition yeah many time value addition is about losing money not actually gaining money so we should look at what are the stages in the value chain which can create new value which can generate surplus not only that if we are talking today about farmer friendly value chains we should move beyond value identification value creation value extraction to the last and fourth stage which is not talked about generally is that value sharing how do we share value with the primary producers or the weaker parties in the chain that is the crux of the matter generally we don't talk about that the last point is that many times farmers also don't do their homework adequately we say there are no farmers markets for farmer produce generally there are more than half a dozen options for a farmer to look at and any farmer located anywhere in india i i generally make this statement would have three options available either the farmers and farmer representatives don't explore that or they don't make enough efforts to get become part of that kind of market so there, there is so much which we need to understand in terms of how do we relook at india's agriculture sector from an agri business perspective and i may make this argument which world bank has agreed recently that if we just keep talking about 42% or 48% of the population workforce in this country contributing only 13 and 1/2% then we are only in a losing game but if we say that no it's not about 13 and 1/2% it's about everything else which happens because of agriculture raw materials involved in that chocolate making or some other fiber or whatever then we may be talking about 25% or plus value added taking place in the agri business sector which takes place because there are farmers producing raw materials so if we make that argument then the whole policy debate changes from a defeating argument to a winning argument for indian agriculture and small producers i i would skip all this because you know it better than me perhaps only thing i want to highlight here is please remember when farmers want to become part of value chains there are issues of exclusion i said about it earlier that they are simply not eligible to become part of these chains even if they try many times the inclusion of these farmers is adverse they end up losing rather than gaining there is a downgrading after they become part actually they end up incurring so much cost and investments that they don't remain capable of being there for longer time they are thrown out out of the value chain over time because of agri business normalization processes which take place sometimes farmers also get upgraded in their operation they become let's say processors from just uh, producers or they become sort of buying agents rather than just producing agents but there is a great amount of rationalization rationalization which happens in value chains this number of farmers over time comes down because companies start preferring larger and larger suppliers and leave out the smaller ones who are also found difficult to carry along because they do not have the capability to manage the increasing demands on quality and cost i'm just showing some pictures of grapes there's so much standards so much quality issues in this that every grape grower based in maharashtra today is able to sell to exporting agencies only one third of the total output the rest ends up going in a local market that is the scenario so it's not everybody's cup of tea to be part of value chains now if we talk about value chain interventions to make value chains farmer friendly then we have to talk about interventions from below rather than from above everybody is doing from above whether it's global corporations or indian companies who are talking about governance standards certifications quality and this and that but nobody wants to talk about supplier capacity building risk reduction better terms of contract and enabling provisions of contracts and arrangements if we are talking about upgrading we have to talk about not of upgrading of chains but upgrading of capacity of suppliers 
Yeah. So all this requires a very different orientation to make chains farmer friendly. If I, I can use that term, though I'm not convinced about it yet. The second is that should we talk about everything when we talk value chains, or we should be very particular about chain and crops and commodities and products which are more suitable for smallholders. And I want to highlight the larger issue here, which I just can't because many times we talk about Indian agriculture, we just end up talking about farmers in general, small farmers sometimes, and we never go beyond. The real heroes and real sheroes of Indian agriculture are the farm workers. We never pay any attention to that. Whether it is in better cotton standard where decent work is only supposed to be promoted by the farmer, not enforced, or it's fair trade where premium meant for producing fairly, has to go to workers, but end up being in community development projects where workers really don't get any great benefit out of it. So these are the real issues which have to be addressed if we have to really make these value chains farmer friendly. I would skip this part, but just make one, if I have, Yuvraj can give me a couple of more minutes. Uh, Yuvraj, is that fine or should I just wind up? Yeah, sir, please, uh, it would be great if you uh, yeah, okay, just wrap it up minutes. in a couple of minutes, please. So we, we need to appreciate that value creation is on the post harvest side. Even if you look at US agribusiness, the input sector and farm production sector contribute only 16%, 84% of the value addition or value creation takes place in the post harvest stage. So unless we look at markets, what I call post production activity, you cannot have small farmers earn more. Producers capture less value because they are not organized. They don't have the mechanisms. Many times, actually, producers actually destroy value. Cooperatives, they destroy value because they're not able to operate efficiently and effectively to benefit the farmers. Now, it's important to realize that private sector is very good at creating value and extracting value. But if we do not have platforms of farmers, that is cooperatives and producer organizations, we cannot capture that value for farmer members. Then the creator takes all the value away. So you have to have an interface of farmers created through these platforms with the corporates that it becomes a win-win situation for both sides rather than being win-lose most of the time. I think I would stop here and come back if needed. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Sapa. Uh, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, food for thought in your presentation, especially, you know, talking about value sharing rather than, you know, creating or, you know, adding values, uh, value. Uh, also, you know, the points regarding how, you know, we can talk about land workers, I mean, agriculture workers, rather not just uh, farmers. And I think we, we would, the idea behind farmer friendly uh, value chains was that when we talked about uh, sustainability in the prequel of this uh, discussion, the idea uh, uh, propounded by one of the panelists was that uh, it should not only sustain the environment, but also sustain the uh, agricultural, uh, agricultural uh, worker or farmer as well. So when we do talk about agriculture value being added into the produce, we want the ecosystem to be more uh, friendly uh, to the uh, producer rather than uh, you know looking at just the constrained uh, you know objectives of the transformation that we are talking about thank you uh, uh, professor sukhpal singh and now i would request uh, uh, P uh, uh, mr p s jay kumar uh, so good afternoon everybody um... Thank you for inviting me here uh, and asking me to speak here. I just thought I would share a few points. Uh, my introduction to agricultural finance has been relatively new. For most part, I worked in a foreign bank where uh, we did everything we could to shun agricultural financing, truth be said. And then in the last four years, I was with Bank of Baroda. I got closer to agricultural financing because it was one of the frontline products for the, for the bank. And I found it to be an extremely challenging area in many ways. When I was initially working in Bank of Joint Bank of Baroda, most of my senior colleagues who were with me and were joined in 1980s were all with an agricultural background. And there was, because at that point of time, a deep thrust post nationalization was being made in agriculture. And I, I assume it was run with a certain amount of passion. 
But over a period of time, things changed. Now, more than 50% of our, of our workforce new hires of women. And the government of India rules seem to push, obligate banks to provide them employment where their husbands live. So getting people to work in agricultural areas become challenging. And the rest of the people who come and join us also come from engineering background and science background. And therefore, when any business line is run because somebody has a compulsion to do an agricultural posting because there's a precondition for promotion, and that is vastly different from working in some area where one has intense passion, then the results of it will become all too soon obvious. So one of the challenges that the banking system faces and will continue to face is how do you get people passionately engaged in agriculture, interested in agriculture, to work in agricultural banking, when in fact the whole system places emphasis on moving people around and there is in fact a lack of some level of specialization, especially with respect to public sector banks. And so therein lies a dilemma with respect to agricultural financing in general terms. Now, more specifically coming down to agricultural finance, over a period of time as I got to study more on the subject, I've become a lot more optimistic about the outlook of agricultural financing for a bunch of reasons. The first and foremost, of course, is that in terms of agricultural rural market, it's an extremely large size. Today, it's estimated to be about 1.3 trillion or approximately 40% of all of India's GDP output. And that, if you were to measure it as a separate country, would be the 11th largest country in economic, in a manner of speaking, economically. So it's a very large market that is there out over there. The second thing, there has been a number of changes for the good that has happened, silent changes, uh, which may not be so obvious at the point when they happen, but over a period of time is a significant cumulative effect. As for example, everybody has a bank account, every farmer has a bank account through Jandan. As for example, mudra loans are available now to diversify from farm employment. As for example, the increasing penetration of digital system, digital banking, digital sales, etc., all of which brings transparency and ease of execution as well. Uh, and so on and so, and the direct benefit transfer and hopefully a universal subsidy replacing all kinds of individual subsidies. All of that stuff uh, augurs well for the long-term growth of agricultural financing in India. Of all of these things, the most important one is the development of technology itself. And the fact that programs such as a platform-based technology and blockchain technology is evolving, which is going to make uh, value chain financing in particular much more efficient to execute. So on the balance, I'm, I'm a lot more optimistic with respect to the future and outcome of agricultural financing. But I do think that the entire area of agricultural banking has got to get significantly changed. And it has to change in a few, in a few ways as I look at it. One is the element of bringing in a greater degree of advisory support for the farmer. And here we talk about advisory both from a product standpoint of view, which is what crop you grow and so on, as well as advisory from a financial management standpoint, which is enabling a systematic method of financial planning and enable the farmers eventually to reach a stage of absolute debt freeness. We need to bifurcate also financing very clearly between its different component, the need for input financing provided more through curated crops, curated products, whether these are seeds or tissue culture based uh, plants, uh, the fertilizers and the, and the, uh, and the other, kind, other ingredients that go along with the pesticides and nutrients and so on. The need for a very specifically classified personal consumption financing that diversifies working capital requirement from personal consumption some form of advanced payment to the future value accretion the farmer is going to make from the agricultural production. The need for a fair amount of financing, particularly with respect to investment credit, as it's broadly called, which is the ability to improve land, micro irrigation, machinery, mechanization, and so on and so forth. And the third element of it is the whole area relating to output financing. The traditional banking financing model that works today is one that is based on a bank assessing a farmer or a customer, providing them with a financing usually based on some laws of averages, 80,000 rupees per acre of land for working capital financing or 150,000 per acre of land for investment credit uh, as, as some form of lending, some kind of perfunctory monitoring, a belief that the banks are actually monitoring. But if I were to go to the database of a bank and tell them, give me all your farmers who are doing basmati rice, for example, there isn't a way to extract such information, for example. So perfunctory management, and the fact that a variety of factors conspire resulting in a non-payment of loans. And sometimes the political interferences through farm waivers and so on may be necessary and justified, but over a period of time has always has, has these challenges of creating uh, you know, negative, uh, negative incentives or perverse incentives. 
So, so there is this whole need uh, to look at that. And the last element is, of course, to get into very sound output management and output financing, which is in some form the input financing, which is which is akin to pre-shipment financing in export in export financing, to be taken out with post-shipment financing, which is output financing, giving the farmer sufficient ability to stand withstand so that they don't need to sell at the farm gate, but can sell at a subsequent point of time when the confluence of circumstances are better for them. And that takes us to the topic of value chain financing. Uh, in general, we have seen value chain financing emerging first in the manufacturing side. We call it supply chain financing. For instance, the, the ability to finance a dealer and credit the manufacturer of say an automobile so that there is a, a frictionless method by which vehicles are dispatched and money is collected and credit is moved from the manufacturer to the dealer and from the dealer thereafter to the consumer. It has also existed in the form of vendor financing where vendors are financed so that the working capital moves to the vendor as opposed to the manufacturer and providing certain efficiencies that arise from there on. So that has in some way derived or become a, a, as, as now evolving into a value chain financing. So let's just explain it with this very simple mechanism of a tomato production, for example, where the factory gate, the output of the factory gate is taken by the commission agent, who then delivers it to the to the to the to the producer of so let's say making tomato ketchup or paste or purees or whatever. And from there, the goods moving to the distributor, and from there moving to the sub-distributors and then moving to the retailers. That in essence is a chain through which the goods starting as tomato ends up as ketchup in the fork pretty much follows. A good value chain financing would be an ability to finance sequentially in a frictionless manner the entire chain. So as the goods move from one point to the other, the recipient of the good is financed so that he pays the predecessor. So the farmer effectively gets paid first and so on and so forth. And therefore, this whole process of managing uh, the sequential financing is what we want to attempt by means of value chain financing. And therefore, a good value chain financing, for example, depends upon whether all the elements of the chain are adequately financed. Each one of them is adequately financed, and so no bottleneck arises. For instance, it is quite common to find that sub-distributors sub don't get adequate financing, which means there is a friction being developed that along the chain, everybody may be getting financed well, but because now we're building a friction or a, a point where somebody is not getting financed optimally, the entire financing system itself gets challenged and the credit itself, what could otherwise be a, a very good credit can effectively turn out to be a more difficult one. So this ability to sequentially finance, as well as make sure that everybody in the chain is financed adequately and on time, uh, is what would be an essence of uh, a good value chain finance program. Let me try to explain this in another way, uh, taking an example of a, of, of a store, for example, uh, that that stocks various kinds of, of various kinds of materials to supermarket. Now, at the supermarket, we need to stock various commodities depending the inventory level, depending upon the season. At some point of time, something is more popular, something is less popular. Maybe 20 days before, cloth is required to be. To be uh, I mean, textile is required. When, you know, stitch uh, cloth is required to be delivered, a shirt or a pant, which essentially means 20 days before somebody has to be financed to buy the raw materials that go into it. Somebody needs to be financed for supplying the various other inputs that go, go into it. So all of these things have to be sequentially and well thought out and organized. But the good thing is because of the development of modern, modern technologies and computational capabilities, all of this can be driven by a well-run simplified AI system that can pretty much identify what is the amount of financing that is required at each of these nodes. And each of these nodes can be adequately financed. So the system as a whole, becomes more efficient. This is what we would like to achieve with respect to agriculture as we would like to achieve with every form of uh, value chain, supply chain, that every derivative is financed adequately. That really is what we want to achieve. Now, what happens in such a model is that the flow of finance and the flow of the information go together and that automatically improves the quality of credit because everybody is aware of what is happening at the next level. And that effectively gives the system as a whole a good sense around what is happening with respect to risk, consequent to which it can make certain changes as for example, increasing or reducing margins that will in, in result in a much more, let's call it a frictionless method of dealing. Now, all of this was difficult up until recently, but because of the development of platform-based technology and blockchains, all of these things are becoming easier. And therefore we are beginning to see a variety of FinTech players coming in the space 
and offering in offering fairly sophisticated levels of services that would make the whole value sustain uh, system uh, finance uh, finance quite well. And in it lies the hope that with technology, we will be able to finance every node, that every node would be aware of what actually is happening with respect to the volumes at each of the node. And that would give a very good sense on what is the risk that exists and then different ways in which this risk can be hedged and managed. Making the system efficient and an efficient system automatically would imply that the cost of financing of the system, cost of financing within the system would, would really come down. So, so that's what we're really looking at, the availability of technology and the availability of new, new, new mechanisms of management that could help us in evolving a good value chain system that could enable all the nodes to be financed adequately in a frictionless form. But we are still a little away from it, but we're beginning to see models of those type emerge. An interesting model that I saw in Calcutta was a case of a, an, uh, of, in an agricultural sector, was a case of a particular company that was actually supplying all the way from tissue uh, plants, tissue culture based plant to the, to the cultivator, which in this case was a banana cultivator and managing the system all the way up to the point where the bananas were being sold out of Tela Gadis. And each of these bananas had a sticker in, 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 in it signifying the brand of, of, the, of the seller. So effectively the whole chain starting from tissue culture on one hand to the, to the last mile of the, of the person in the cart selling the bananas, the whole system was reasonably well financed. And that's where we were getting involved. And the solution we were trying to deal with was essentially this, that if as a bank, we could figure out some way by which we could move the coins efficiently, because in this case, it was all the transactions was happening in one rupee and two rupees and five rupees. And the management of the coin turned out to be the most difficult element of this entire financing, this entire chain. And therefore trying to solve that problem would effectively enable us to do a fairly frictionless method of financing where the risk would be managed because in the morning you would be giving credit to the telawala person, the cart person to buy the bananas. In the evening, he would pay us out from the sale proceeds. Obviously, some amount of money would flow to the next day for settlement, but the whole thing could be so effortlessly managed. That could be done provided in this case, we could solve the point of dealing with coins, which we then try to deal it through uh, this other link payment and you know the digital method of payment and so on. And, Obviously, post-COVID, uh, those situations are further improved. The penetration is improved. So I would say to you that the, the challenges are very much visible, but the availability of technology and, 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 the, the, and would enable, uh, I would think, in a rapid way, uh, you know, for, for the systems to evolve. And we could have very well-designed, intelligent systems that work, that would ensure that the credit is available at each of the nodes in adequate quantity for the adequate amount of days risk are better assessed and therefore the risk management and the risk hedging could be done more efficiently. In it lies probably a solution, not only with respect to a particular situation of the farmer, but also with respect to many of the situations we see today in, in our banking need, where there are many nodes through which the product from the fork, from the, from the manufacturing point, to the end consumer is delivered. But each of the time the problem arises because one or a couple of elements of the node do not get adequately funded because of perceived risk or whatever be the reason. And that effectively ends up affecting the efficiency of the whole chain as a whole. And as they say, the strength of the chain is often in its weakest link. So I'm therefore thinking, and therefore my view is that these forms of technology will, will develop and will start accelerate and start accelerating develop. In Bank of Boda, for example, we devised a program called Kisan Sati, uh, which essentially is a platform on which a farmer can onboard himself. He would find sellers of various input materials who are going to be supplying him with input. He would also see in the same platform, several people who would be buying products from him. As a consequence, the whole, the whole ecosystem as it were is loaded into this platform and therefore there's a very efficient way uh, for that system to work. And, and part of the reason why farmers failed to repay loan was their own engagement with the, with the bank was slow. And therefore my view was if you could build a good system, the farmer's engagement with the bank would be higher. There's more value addition being provided by the bank. And that engagement in itself would make people more conscious about the need to manage credit and the need to manage money, which in turn would push the system to work more efficiently. I would, get, I would think we would get a chance to answer some of the questions that may arise, but I find this to be an exciting area. I see technology as a harbor of change. Um, you know, today we are not merely talking about just-in-time management in case of uh, somebody like a Daimler Benz, for example, the payment to the manufacturer, the payment to the supplier is made when the individual component is, is loaded in the car and the assembly chain. 
it is to that extent it is fine when, uh, you know it's fine tuned high quality erp systems that talk to each other seamless settlements so i do think this is also going to happen to agriculture it's only a matter of time but if you all start thinking about it and preparing ourselves and making the right investment in technology the right in investment in the all risk architecture system these things can see happening earlier than later thank you thank you uh, mr jaykumar i mean i very informative and educative for me uh, personally um, especially the points that you made regarding sequential financing and you know making sure there is adequate financing available at every node of the value chain which in you know uh, which otherwise the it puts a strain on the whole value chain itself and makes the whole uh, financing uh, unsustainable thank you uh, uh, mr jaykumar and you. you know when you said finance and information go together uh, uh, on information uh, mr rajesh sena has been uh, uh, you know working in a uh, neml and inf how information uh, is you know, produced and uh, conveyed in markets information from you know just production to value chains i would request mr sinha to also uh, you know point out kind of marks and marketing channels are required for the transformed uh, agriculture that we are speaking of uh i would request uh, mr sanjeev uh, astana from who is the ceo of ruchi soya industries to give us a, a you know end to end overview of uh, the uh, value chain uh, from a perspective on agri business and you know processing industry um, mr astana over to you sir uh thank you yuvraj and uh, and good afternoon uh, uh, to everyone uh and you know my task gets a little easy when uh, you know very erudite and extremely knowledgeable people uh, have spoken before me uh, my fellow panelists uh, i'll just uh, you know bring a perspective to the practicality of business and really uh, you know what is uh, what has been done uh, what the current context is and what truly uh, you know could be the missing pieces and if taken up uh, you know in the right uh, right way it would mean that uh, you know whether we call it farmer friendly or you know viable policies for the producers but uh, that does become important so let me just uh, let me just start from so the two elements one is that farmer as a producer and uh, and then on the other side is a market side of it so today he interfaces with a range of uh, buyers whether it is a commission agent whether it is a you know the village level consolidator whether it is the traders or uh, it could be direct markets as well whether he does it through the fpo system you know cooperative self help groups or or whatever manner and i think that uh, part is important for the markets to function really what's important is that uh, you know the markets efficiently function when there's a legal framework and uh, there's a sanctity of contract uh, there is uh, you know the transactions are uh, you know getting handled and tackled uh, in a sense that uh, which do get recorded and uh, ultimately that uh, business functions only when it is viable and that is where the fundamental uh, fundamental problem lies in india so wherever the agriculture businesses where the producers were involved through whatever structure they uh, they have been transacting if it was viable if it was sensible it worked and uh, we don't uh, you know yet need to go in the direction of trying to resolve every single nut and bolt and every single little element in the in the transaction cycle but really if the substantial part of the business has worked and so you know there was examples are galore so for example the oil palm cultivation with the right policy measure right support you know companies obligated to perform certain functions and pretty much uh, though not precisely contract farming where the government needed to intervene as well Uh, has worked exceedingly well uh, in india if you look at organic uh, you know uh, producers uh, you know very much on a contract uh, basis works very well because there's a dedicated buyer and uh, you know there's a mutual dependency of the farmer and the and the buyer uh, for that to function well uh, similarly if i were to look at all the plantation crops i mean i i can give through a grape exports i think uh, which was pointed out earlier that that has worked well but likewise there are at a 
smaller scale, micro level, larger levels, uh, the business of agriculture has worked exceedingly well, notwithstanding the fact that there was no sort of legal framework in the way it has been supported recently. So much as we discuss about the, uh, you know, the changes in the, uh, in the law itself, which will fundamentally alter, uh, you know, the dynamics at the farm gate level, I don't believe uh, that to be the true. So, you know, the market tends to find its own ways. What the government has done is it's cleaned up, cleared up the path that uh, the local well level challenges of, uh, uh, you know, the local officials, uh, the uh, state governments, uh, you know, the commission agents that the farmer was not forced to sell through the money structure, but he pretty much, uh, you know, had the freedom, has the freedom now uh, to use alternate channels to look at wherever the best opportunities. And uh, he goes and sells through that and integrates himself into whatever form of value chains uh, which are present in the country today. The problem is very different that uh, even if this law were to be cleared, and that is a uh, submission I'm giving, that till the time, a lot of other elements are not cleaned up uh, around the business itself. It will remain an issue. And uh, which is where I think the fundamentals of uh, you know, viable business uh, we need to think through. So for example, there are two states which did not have any Monday Act, uh, like Bihar and Kerala. And uh, we all know that uh, you know, Bihar has uh, serious challenges in terms of you know, the, uh, the, despite no Monday, uh, a sort of APMC Act, uh, despite the fact that so we did not see much of, uh, you know, the infrastructure coming up. Uh, we did not see that too many uh, uh, sort of players coming in to buy directly from the farmers. Uh, the challenge around the pricing, the gut slot pressure, the risk management, and a whole lot of things which farmers continue to face. Uh, really, we did not see much of a resolution on, the, on that account, despite uh, APMC not being applicable in the States for, I don't know for how long, maybe more than 10 years now. Uh, so, which brings me to the basic point that uh, does the legal framework alone lead to solutions? Uh, the answer is a flat no. So, what is it that uh, would integrate farmers in a better way uh, into the value chains? And there are value chains which very clearly which are there today. So, you know, whether it is uh, moving through a very circuitous route uh, through Mandi and village level consolidators or whatever manner, those value chains exist. And ultimately, fact remains that uh, farmers produce and consumers consume or the factories, uh, you know, get it and they further process it. So right now, I'm not getting into the argument of, uh, uh, you know, this issue related to how much does a farmer get uh, of the final end price, because that that is very complex. It's not very straightforward to really define that should farmer be getting 80% of the you know, final uh, consumer price or do farmers get less? I think that uh, is another topic in itself fully uh, to understand that truly how the supply chain, the pricing functions, what is the economics of uh, uh, you know, the entire uh, one single sort of value chain where the investments lie, who takes a larger risk uh, and uh, you know who is ultimately financing the entire transaction so where does it sit and that's a longer and a larger debate i don't want to get into that part but let me come back again to you know really what the changes are happening and how can this work a little better so three things which are very positive in india's favor and uh, and and perhaps some smaller things as well so one is the emergence of new players. I think clearly what we are seeing is that the agriculture as it has moved away from very cereal based uh, farming and uh, which was dependent on the, uh, you know, the uh, government procurement. I think that steadily uh, more, not on account of any major policy intervention or otherwise, but clearly the forces of supply and demand have enforced that. So which means that the share of high value agriculture, which meant, uh, you know, businesses like poultry and uh, aquaculture or, uh, uh, you know, dairy and horticulture and bamboo and organic and, uh, you know, a whole, whole lot of them really have, including the forestry produce as well. I mean, the, you know, really that the share of high value agriculture is more than three fourths of the ag GDP. And, uh, but if you look at the, uh, if you look at the uh, mind space and the narrative, it is the other one fourth, which occupies more of the narrative, uh, you know, in terms of discourse uh, in the media or otherwise that really, you know, the MSP purchased by FCI with this viable, not viable or otherwise. So I think that fundamentally has changed. And the good two features of the high value agriculture is, uh, uh, and, and that's where some problem lies as well. A, it, uh, uh, it's 
more than three and a half, four times the value per hectare of uh, produce. That's one big benefit. It uses a lot of uh, technology. Uh, I mean, technology, when I'm saying in terms of the growing, the application, so there's a science part of that is quite actively involved in that. And the third visit, uh, bit is that it needs a lot more financing and more importantly now, it needs infrastructure of certain kind at a basic level and, uh, you know, which is vibrant and which is sensible. So I think that is driving a change. So already we are seeing very successful value chains around, you know, a whole lot of uh, areas and it's very difficult to go into them. Uh, some often spoken about uh, ones like uh, potatoes and, you know, around uh, organic or otherwise which are strong but there are a lot of other micro level local area level state level value chains which are emerging which are very successful the second one is that uh, the government has uh, and my only submission on that part i don't want to take too much time is related to the government change in the regulations i think now the important part is that centrally once it is cleared that how do we persuade uh, and how does the industry persuade and how do the states get persuaded themselves that they need to facilitate the businesses to be actively integrating themselves to the value chains, to the supply chains as they merge in the, at the farm gate level, which means that, uh, you know, the support at a very local level, at a Monday level, not come in the way, uh, not come out with, uh, you know, the uh, interpretation, which is totally against, uh, you know, the role of uh, procurers, whether government or private sector, uh, state governments have to clean up the act because ultimately it is farmer friendly. So I think government to a large extent has done its role, but there are some other elements I have got a recommendation they need to speak about. The third important change which has happened is that, uh, you know, the FPO whole mechanism which has come up and of course, though much needs to be done about it, but I think the very fact that a recognition that the FPOs can be the direct and good tools to, uh, to make viable or organizations which can connect with the marketplace in a contract-based mode in a sensible way rather than small and marginal farmers who would find it extremely onerous and difficult uh, to connect in a sensible way. I think FPOs are a big answer to that. And uh, similarly, uh, whether whatever the structure be, whether the self-help groups or whether it is a cooperative, whether it's FPOs, whether it's a private, uh, uh, you know, sort of any other form of aggregation which is there, I think that is a very critical part which can uh, certainly uh, uh, sort of, you know, extremely helpful in the value chains. And the other two parts is that, uh, you know, the smaller but very critical is related to the uh, whole issue around the, you know, the technology, whether it's a FinTech, whether it's, a, you know, other technology fit, where the asymmetry in the information is gradually getting eroded because the, uh, you know, the farmers are still, and, you know, the broadband, the connectivity to the rural areas, to the farmers, I think that's becoming very, very, uh, you know, positive. I think uh, that will improve. And I think ability for money to go directly into the farmer's account in a sensible way, I think that will be tremendously helpful. So those, uh, you know, those elements, these changes, I think will continue to drive and make a big difference, which is going to happen. Our problem is that the, when I talk about the micro successes or smaller successes or some small successes, a country of 128 odd million farmers where we produce more than a billion tons of uh, different kinds of produce and, uh, you know, which is uh, these successes are few and far between, very small. So how do we clean this up? You know, how do we make it better, whether it is whatever means ultimately are formed? And uh, we need to have successful examples. We need to have, you know, the capacity building of uh, whatever these aggregated organizations are emerging now, you know, like FPOs or cooperatives or whatever. How do we build their capacity to become better entrepreneurs? How do we provide financial support? And which is where I'm coming now to the critical role of the financial support, which has to be provided by the government. Uh, at another level, the capacity building, which has to be done. And I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. So how do we ensure that uh, these FPOs are trained? They, they're able to understand what are the spot markets, how they can hedge their risk on futures exchange. I hope Rajesh joins and tells us about, uh, about the futures and the spot markets and what technology is uh, playing a role in the risk management uh, dimensions to it. And, uh, you know, similarly, the financial support, whether it's through the Mudra loan structure, whether it is through, uh, you know, easier means where the, uh, you know, there's some backup uh, guarantee for the loans being provided by other institutions, uh, whether we get patient capital, uh, you know, investing, it's uh, putting its might behind it, or whatever way, but we need, organizations need money. And FPO simply by deploying certain amount of money and setting it up and getting it moving will not help at all. I think what is required is that they need working capital, they need support. And I think if they need counter guarantees of insurance and, uh, you know, certain collaterals, et cetera, are waived and, uh, you know, they become, and on a sustained basis, it has to be provided. 
and if certain losses have to be incurred then uh, you know we should uh, I, whoever ultimately bears that loss or uh, you know the defaults i think that is going to make a massive difference uh, to the fortunes of uh, you know fpos as they struggle to basically get viable and uh, and get operationally active and start to build them up the third piece in that is of course the fintech i think that was going to make it a lot easier and work through i'll come to the role of private sector and uh, last two three minutes you raj i don't want to take too much time the private sector uh, clearly is playing dominant role in the three fourths of the agriculture today right now whether the private sector we talk is a large uh, large private sector or we talk uh, mid sized corporates or small companies or we talk of micro level entrepreneurs the fact is private sector is the one which is dealing with nearly 80% plus of the agriculture produced buying so really the government's role is just about 10 12% 15% of what they buy uh, you know through the msp operations or otherwise and the support that and i think that is a part i don't want uh, to get into that discussion right now uh, because you know there are a lot more dimensions around that and uh, which is uh, not the remit of uh, this panel to be discussing that but the fact remains that the private sector needs to play a stellar role and private sector is connecting now the more i see it you know i see a proliferation of these new enterprises which are on spot markets uh, setting up private mandis uh, you know getting to understand uh, you know how things uh, things move at the ground level and i'm seeing clearly a big difference uh, you know which is uh, making so at least we are seeing the initial spurt of activities which a policy change has created but uh, the spurt of activities has to be sustained it has to be supported it has to be uh, it has to be uh, structured in a manner that the you know the meaningful collaboration or the interface between the production system to the supply chains to the infrastructure and to the ultimate buyer whether it's a food processing company or is a consumers i think that needs to get more viable and stronger but the it is just the start i i, I think we really need to go a long way uh you know build up examples of the successful examples as to what worked and what challenges they faced the failures if they have failed and why did they fail and what could have been done better but uh, that becomes exceedingly important that uh, you know the part of sustaining this this path of uh, once the regulations are cleared up the how do we how do we make state governments the local institutions partner in this whole process that this becomes a sustained uh, path towards the integrated value chains which farmer friendly value chains uh, you know if we insist on calling those can become uh, can become better my last part is that uh, uh, you know this whole issue of uh, relationship led farming contract farming small and marginal farmers or otherwise uh, the fact remains that there are multiple examples uh, globally whether you feel look at china whether you look at uh, at the micro level in certain uh, you know in the in the central american countries where the value chains around cocoa around uh, you know around whole bunch of other producer coffee uh, in a big way if you are looking at certain successful examples in africa and uh, then we have large scale industrial farming in the in the northern uh, in north america or we look at uh, latin america and south america those are very different kinds of farming but there are great and successful examples where the smaller and marginal farmers without necessarily getting integrated into certain organizational fit have very successfully integrated them not with the local value chains but into the global value chains and uh, so we should not shy away i don't think that uh, this whole issue around uh, uh, you know the uh, whether the it there needs to be an organization fit where the producers integrate themselves sensibly i think we need to look at uh, uh, you know the ultimately devil is in details that how each value chain works so value chain of apple is very different than value chain for, for example mustard or uh, you know value chain for uh, for uh, for almonds out of uh, you know jammu and kashmir or saffron will be incredibly different than mango value chain for example and i think uh, where the policy needs to look at differently and uh, is that uh, and where the financial institutions have to look at differently that uh, these are 100 different businesses and uh, how do you customize solutions around each of these uh, elements in a sensible way that uh, ultimately is be benefiting that value chain rather than having a pan india country wide policy and i think that is where uh, you know india needs to do a lot more Work, whether it is a financial institution whether it is a government uh, you know or the people who influence policy including uh, academia and the researchers that how do we pinpoint that these value chains have different dimensions have different uh, nodes have different uh, ways of working and i think unless we start addressing those in a viable and sensible way 
uh, we will find that uh, we will continue debating the same thing uh, next year and the year after and the year after. So some improvements will keep happening with the mass scale, large scale movement in a very decisive way will make a change. I think uh, will remain uh, uh, to that extent as to where we really stand. I think some improvements will come, but not uh, otherwise. Uh, so to sum it up, we need uh, policy which is sensibly looking in a practical way. We need uh, viable financial support in the long term to these uh, these uh, the institutions which are coming up, like FPOs and others. Uh, we need to look at uh, uh, you know uh, look at technology in a different way. And most important, I repeat again, is that how does the regulatory agencies or the administrative structures at the ground level in the state governments and at a very very local district level, how are they made part of this whole movement? So they realize that the success of this entire, uh, you know, agriculture being connected to the markets and incomes going up because it's politically viable as well. And how do they become part of this chain and uh, are able to manage and effectively support this move towards integrated value chains, which can work sensibly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sthana, for giving us a context of, you know, global uh, value chain market and also uh, pointing out the changes which are uh, underway already in terms of emergence of a lot of new players and you know uh, including you know the mechanism of F FPOs and FPCs and how uh, a sustained support is required uh, you know to uh, build capacity to make sure that the value addition uh, happens in a manner that that is you know uh, going back into the uh, all all the players in the chain. Meanwhile, uh, we have uh, Mr. Vijay Mahajan, who is the director of Rajiv Gandhi Institute for Contemporary Studies. Um, uh, VM, uh, I would request you to please, uh, please say, uh, share your views on the current discussion and we'll take, uh, carry over into the discussion then. Thank you, Yuvraj. <clears throat> First of all, uh, let me say what a treat it was to listen to uh, the three speakers, uh, uh, starting with Supal's very uh, <clears throat> you know spirited uh, overview of the uh, in some ways the underlying political economy of indian agriculture uh, and uh, <clears throat> though by the way we've had the privilege of barbara harris being on all of our webinars and she just left because she usually leaves by five uh, but uh, supal you may have read her question uh, on the chat box and she has <laughs> Uh, kind of made the point that you know you're probably uh, making the whole uh, scenario appear bipolar, you know, uh, corporate interests versus small farmers. And she made the point that actually the ecosystem is uh, multiple players of multiple sizes and multiple interests. But nevertheless, I think I, I you know, your basic point, which you illustrated interestingly with the U.S. data. Uh, that only 16% of the total value added uh, is at the farm gate and the rest of it, 84% is beyond the farm gate. And unless the farmer is a shareholder in the rest of the value chain, it's like producing a surrogate baby, you know, the surrogate mother. So the issue is, what do we do to move farmers from being surrogate mothers to actual lifelong parents of the produced till it reaches the consumer. And I think a number of points that Sanjeev made uh, were actually, uh, you know, uh, more pragmatic suggestions towards that, recognizing the fact that we've had, uh, you know, a very difficult political economy. I mean, it's, it's just, by the way, it's just 70 years ago that the Zamidari Act was abolished in this country. And you know, indeed, the first amendment to the Indian constitution had to be brought about because the Zamidari Act looked like it may not go through, you know, uh, in UP. <clears throat> so, uh, so from there we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. And I think it's important as uh, to remember that we 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 need to uh, take into account the interests of, uh, you know. First of all, you know, the fact that a uh, large number of consumers are, you know, currently able to consume above minimum standards required because of food subsidies on the one side, you know, the National Food Security Act. And on the other hand, a large number of farmers are able to continue to 
remain in farming only because of uh, you know msp and other subsidies to the agriculture sector so how do we you know and this is where the point that jay kumar uh, mentioned how do we move from this 90s 1960s late 1960s solution which was uh, financing solution which was put together basically the state subsidizing both the producer and the consumer in which we got locked in how do we get beyond that to a more sustainable solution because you know the nature of uh, the fiscal deficits that existed even before uh, the covid uh, pandemic and now you know we are talking of double digit fiscal deficits between the center and the states and it is just going to be impossible to sustain a dual subsidy regime so if we have to go beyond that then how do we handle it? and by the way remember the point that sanjeev made that the government is involved in only about 15% of the total uh, you know agriculture produces <clears throat> uh, procurement and marketing 15 not even 50 so had this regime been extended to a much larger percentage we would be uh, you know uh, it will be completely unsustainable you know so uh, so i think the one of the questions that we need to uh, while we you know this phrase agricultural transformation in india is bandied about a lot but our attempt in this webinar and thank you yuvraj for organizing this series has been to to unpack it what does un transformation mean so there is transformation in the production side there is transformation in the financing side there is transformation in the procurement marketing side and there is transformation in the value addition side and <clears throat> uh because of strong past vested interests uh, controlling a lot of the discourse uh, you know it is not possible to make progress and we what we were hoping by by having this multidisciplinary and multiple perspective uh, conversation was to you know say that ye bhi satya hai aur ye bhi satya hai you know jo jo sapal lega wo bhi satya hai lekin ye bhi baat satya hai ke you know corporates will be the first ones to quit agriculture if they start getting a negative rate of return for more than 2 years in succession you know so we have to recognize these realities and uh, you know move and the third satya is ki the sarkar is broke the sarkar neither has the fiscal capacity nor the institutional capacity anymore to pull off a second green revolution which is badly needed i mean whatever be its component i mean what dr samnathan called the evergreen revolution and all of that uh, so this time around the solution for india's agricultural transformation cannot be state led but if it is not state led and if it is led by the private sector then the issues that sukhpal raised are going to be very important you know that an element of trust Uh, an element of fair sharing of the value addition in the chain is built into the whole thing and unfortunately the recent uh, laws that have come up do not seem to give that that flavor to farmers you know uh, that you know uh, so uh, so we are actually according to me the real crisis right now in indian agriculture is uh, is a knowledge crisis you know and sukhal that's why as an academic as as you know as a as a very deeply practicing academic i think it's a major challenge for for you and your colleagues to to come up with a you know a set of framing questions uh, that we'll have to together solve you know the fact that we keep producing 220 or 250 million tons of food grain and national food security act and all that chalo achhi baat hai at least we're not leaving ship to mouth but we are not anywhere near making a uh, transformation and some of the ideas that jay kumar mentioned about financing including that you know the, the wonderful idea of uh, information at every step moving along and the, and the same uh, amount of financing basically going up incrementally with uh, with every value chain uh, stage uh, you know happening seamlessly because of digital uh, uh, tracking and using things like blockchains and so forth so uh, you know 
so listening to this webinar i actually my tension level about india's agriculture transformation has if anything gone up you know because i don't think we are we are able to have a dialogue uh, where our past positions are left behind we don't check in with that baggage and we look at the challenge uh, ab initio so the challenge is a big one and by the way uh, none of the three of you have significantly talked about you did mention in passing but significantly talked about the biggest challenge which is coming from non human sources which is climate change and it may have been caused by human intervention but the fact is that the results of climate change are so large and so beyond capacities of nation states or the private sector to handle that unless we come up with a transformational solution you know we could we could be wiping out even the successes that were made in the last 30 40 years so it's a it's an epistemological challenge sukpal and, uh, and and you you will really need all the help you can get from people like jay kumar and sanjeev and rajesh let me invite you back thank you yeah yeah my apologies for this uh, unstable connection so let me quickly you know we don't have a lot of time so i will try to close what i am saying within as less time as possible so it brings me back professor supal has been my professor uh, and uh, at irma and it's great to be you know listening to him after a long time uh, so let me start with a normal farmer friendly value chain ecosystem that we talk about so first is farmer and a lot has been talked about to so farm itself uh, is a question in point whether we want to do a village was a original unit of land holding so if i talk about my village in bihar in alunda district or i talk about a village in jharkhand or in himachal you know other than geographical uh, distinction what is important is a village had a land unit of 1000 to 1200 to 1800 acres and that was the whole system how the entire revenue collection used to happen as a block was a bigger unit so generally you know uh, a zamindar would be around a block kind of a piece beyond that possibly patwaris and at village level so we need to reimagine today today it is possible to reimagine villages and look at them as one single unit we did pri panchayat raj institution improvements but more or less that has failed to the extent that the people are not responsible there so that's the first piece do we reimagine farm and do we really look at creating a farm today harvesting so uh, farmers in bihar we are not able to afford the labor of bihar so entire village come together for harvesting so combine comes and in a certain time if few farms are left they forcefully they harvest it because they know there is no other way we do know we do not have cattle to plow any more so that's the transformation that has already happened and here we are talking about i had a chance to live for four months in my native due to forced covid situations when i moved to mumbai for uh, going to personal emergency so the first piece i am saying it has already happened we are catching up and we are behind and i can tell you for sure as farmers we cannot pay the farm labor the price in money service class has already gone out so let's talk about first five want to create a farmer friendly value system there have been some failed attempts in past in trying to create a corporate farming but it is the right time we have infrastructure has changed there is road right there there is tap water electricity is there connection is uh, no longer a issue so infrastructure issues are gone communication issues has already been has moved by leaps and bounds so i am talking about the new generation the way they look at it they don't look at it i am kind of a middle generation i would say at 50 close to 50 years i am neither here nor there okay so but i can say for sure the young population knows much more than us they have breaking barriers like nothing other so that's first piece is look about farm when you talk about a farmer friendly value chain how do you reimagine a farm system go to those villages trust me that's how it works now let's look at how it gets bought and sold i will again go back to bihar from where i come from and i went to a person who used to study with me he dropped out at he dropped out in 8th class i had a fortune to move from my village to a military school in ajmer and then study in bhu and then go to irma these are all you know good progress to me uh, but that guy dropped out and today he runs a very successful uh, buying selling thing he he is the only guy who sells mustard oil at 200 rupees a kg in my village and people buy from him 
So what was he doing? He says, if you have more than two bags, give it to me. I will pay you at 18% per month interest. If you have less than that, take that money out. You want emergency funds, I will give you. And he has a kolu there. He says, you want to see it? Please come and see. He gets money by the local professionals, teachers, engineers, government officials, who pay him, say, okay, this is what you're going to. So he has some kind of a, uh, what you call, Sortex machine, a very generic version. And I could see even German companies flyers there with that guy who is eight pass. He has an office as sophisticated as we can think of. So what is this showing actually? Education and the way we think is no longer a barrier. He understands basic marketing. He is not going to create brand. He says, "Ah, brand nahi chalega. ITC se 10 saal mein brand nahi bana profitable. Mere se kya banega?" So, in short, he was saying, if ITC couldn't make a brand in 10 years profitable, and it's, I think, going to take a little more time before they venture into this with all the might. Thinking about farmers and farm aggregators that go and create a brand, I'm not saying discourage them, but be realistic. Markets are ruthless. They are ruthless in US. They are ruthless in India and only most efficient will survive. So let's look at this value chain like that. We are talking about a processing, I've talked about processing, we've talked about packaging. This guy has right from 500 ml, in fact, he has 50 ml bottles also. The, the teacups which have become smaller in two rupees or one rupee or five rupee that you get, he sells in that, the, that is his measure for mustard oil for low, you know, somebody who is a daily wager, to a 10 kg pack. Now let me come now to farmers to farmer institutions. What does this talk about? We have this system of refinance piece. So government, as the Professor Paulson talked about, government gives it to uh, NABARD, NABARD gives it to another finance agency. That finance agency's cost of funds is some 14% or 13%. This also gets added, which is a very small portion in his kitty. The farmer or farmer aggregator still gets a tax percentage, which is again 18% plus. So unless we ensure that they are equated and a lot of these laws has already done that. So that's the second piece. Let's talk about institutions coming together to deliver the efficiency and brutal efficiency, I will say, of those people who are at the bottom end. Unorganized sector is not inefficient. Let's not take it like that. Go to London there also, I think it's only 40% which is organized in perishables, especially fresh. Now, quickly, I will talk about the last piece. And... Uh, Mr. Vijay Mahajan already talked about it. From a food deficit nation, we are already a food surplus nation. We produce more wheat, more rice, more banana, more milk than what we can consume. Obviously, we still don't produce enough edible oil. Now, to get into that, so when we try to create NCDXC markets, that was the entity which over a period of more than a decade, we, that's the only successful B2B marketplace, if you can call it, which is not into futures. The 2003 model of uh, commodity derivatives has only thing that has happened, it has gone down, 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 down. Today, there is nothing very significant to talk about its impact on the farmers. Effort is immense. So what are we talking about? The institutions which were set up in a food deficit era need to be redefined. So when you wanted to make a larger footprint, that was my journey from a corporate to an NGO and to another institution, possibly commodity exchanges to me looked like as nation pervasive and they could create a large impact. You know where I ended? In the government. Because government still is the largest commodity trader in this country. Now, that also brings us to the definition of market. Market is very, very different than marketing. It's not the same. So what are we talking about? We our markets, commodity agriculture markets are in a very, very basic stage of marketing where government calls shots even today. We repealed that act called Essential Commodity Act. And we, even before ink drew, uh, ink, ink dried up, and we here we had on the onion, it the same was imposed. So our commodity markets are still in the very, very basic stage of a market development in terms of market development. We are still on a 0 to 10 scale. I think we'll be on 3. Our branding and all is a different story. So creation of brands is a powerful tool in the hands of powerful people, those who can spend money for a lot of time. Someone like Kellogg's has a generational plan for changing breakfast habits. 
they run on a 40 years plan because they say 20 years is a generation. One parent who experiences it, their kids need to experience it and their kids' kids need to experience it. That's the kind of plan they run. We could not be expecting farmer aggregates to do all of it. So let's, that's where I say electronic marketplace is a far better stuff. It's not same as e-trading. Two of us trade electronically, that's e-trading. But that's not same as e-market. We have not framed rules for e-markets. We have ended up saying arbitrator would be the lowest level judiciary person uh, in a district that is the educator today. Can anybody create markets? Like we had earlier all the Bombay Stock Exchange and everybody else, uh, I think we had some 23, 24 stock exchanges. Today we have two, uh, two large ones and then two commodity exchanges have added up. We have four of them. They were mutualized. So not any value chain player or anyone who, who can own a market, somebody who has is responsible. So market is a rule-based place where buyers and sellers can meet. I would say all market functionally. So that brings me to the last point of saying, are we going to make markets efficient? So what are the markets we have? We have commodity exchanges. At the apex market, we just decide thrives on price discovery. They are in a very, very rudimentary stage there. Then we have physical market yards, which are called APMC sub yards. You call it RMC or APMC, where, is it, where, where it's not the marketing board that controls, it's called regional municipal corporation. Essentially administrative piece where you know uh, consumer goods could be bought and sold, commodity being one of them, they regulate it. So we need to not only look at regulation, so we have just three steps to go about. First, create one state, one market that we talked about. Because state itself is a large unit. Allow, let each state recognize another state. When we say state, first you have to make main market yard very efficient. How does it become efficient? From trinkets market, which is the hearts. If there are enough material, it goes to sub-market yard. Now, if you don't have economic lot, and that brings to the central point that the Professor Sokol talked about, what is economy, what is economist, where is the negotiation power? So if you have a very viable way of linking a produce sale to his account, his or her account, then a banker can actually say, yes, I can see a transaction over here saying this particular commodity is being traded and I can give a credit against that. But if that is not there, it's just a mere money deposit. So electronic markets need to be reimagined. Our Indian markets are in dire need of reimagination, right from farm to farmer to farm aggregates to post harvest value chain and to those brand builders who can leverage the power of brand to give more money back to farmers like Amul has done. It has shown that efficiency could actually give much more. So what we were talking about 16 to 29% is the range that any farmer gets in a processed commodity. Globally, it's a processed commodity. In India, we are buying apples at 200 to 300 rupees a kg around the area. In my village also, we get a poor quality apple, but the people person still charges me 200 rupees. Here, the world is coming to India. They want our dairy, our consumer markets to be opened for dairy, for fruit and vegetables because Indian consumers are treated as an affluent consumers. We have bought more dry fruits than European countries this time. And we have been doing it for ages now. That talks about other story. Believe in us, have one system. There's no need to have today a separate globe value chain or packaging system for exports and domestic consumers. Have the same, we can do it. Why differentiate? Have just single standard. The farmers do not get exorbitantly more price when their produce are exported. It's not true. And it's a very small quantity that gets why don't we look at Indian consumer system, build systems universally for it? There is no need to have a separate value chain for exporters. It means our domestic consumer can consume anything which is not safe. So I think I can go on and on, but let me stop here. So to create farmer-friendly value chains is important that we reimagine all of this. And it can be done by a market only. Market is an entity which binds all of this together. Male me dhage wala kaam karta. And we need multiple markets, more innovations than we can think. And innovations need to sustain, not given by, not granted aid by the government. We know fiscals is not there. We don't have fiscal space even to pay insurance premium for all the farmers. Forget about buying their produce back. And no country in the world has that. And the second is that we are anyway part of global value chain now. There are international trade and all. So we have no option but to move forward. The only positive piece is 
younger generation which is right now teaming they are going to come up with innovations possibly we cannot think of and better we join them than we kind of discussing this so let's act and that's about it thank you right uh, thank you uh, mr sina uh, for you know luckily we got time to uh, listen to you as well but uh, in the meanwhile we have come to the absolute end of our uh, scheduled time uh, but we do have uh, a few questions that uh, if uh, with the permission of the panelists i would like to raise the first one being that there are multiple uh, agri verticals uh, you know how do we integrate them into uh, you know to build a uh, credible value chain and you know what is the mechanism to achieve that so i think i would request maybe uh, mr asthana to respond to that uh yuvraj can i quickly repeat that question again please i think i just uh, the second part i could not hear properly what was that question okay so second part was that uh, uh, what is the mechanism for integrating different agri verticals to build a sustained value chain in a look i think uh, yeah sure i i, th I think uh, if i understand the question right that uh, you know these specific solutions so i i spoke and i'm I, i'm from believer in this that uh, the single biggest policy which uh, the problem is with the in both in our research uh, the narrative the policy formation and the practitioners or even people like us when we talk about it we talk agriculture as a whole and uh, there's nothing called agriculture as a whole okay so there's a different uh, uh, value chain for apples there's a different value chain i think rajesh was speaking about the mustard uh, uh, you know crushing or uh, you know or for the wheat or basmati rice and within rice itself there could be five other different value chains so and then the problem in india is that uh, you know we talk uh, we prescribe a lot of solutions with that as a whole rather than that i think there are industries and areas and segments which are all very specific and i think the efforts have to be done to find customized and very you know that is where the real focus of the research and and the and the, the and the money has to be directed towards and the resources uh, you know sort of uh, uh, you know pushing in that direction where we need to find solutions for uh, you know the banana farmers in jalga what is the solution for that and uh, that is where we need to really understand and uh, you know the beauty of the western system where the, you know the amount of detail working around every single element whatever they pick up uh, you know is just enormous and i think that's what the kind of effort what we need to make and uh, so really there's no prescription per se i think we need to get more focused look at value chains very differently each of these elements and break it down and come out with solutions for that right thank you uh, mr sthana so point being that there's no one uh particular prescription for all the uh, value chains which exist and for different commodities uh in agriculture um the uh, next question is from uh, professor somnath kosh who is here with us uh, this was in relation to the you know the first presentation which was done by uh, a colleague from i am ahmedabad he talked a lot about the you know he was the only person who talked about the agriculture workers and that that is the reason why i said that the study by you know the study indicates that there's a dip in the agricultural uh, workers and the conditions are pretty bad so given that uh, context does it impact the discussion at hand you're talking about building you know <coughs> value chains but if you are going to lose leave out the agriculture workers which happen to be a strong component of it so where exactly do we stand is in that context that i thought the question sir i can say my village huh? today all the farm laborers are far more affluent than farmers all the farm people they are going out and working okay so i think if one has to look at evidences we don't have kacha houses anymore i don't know what we have researches which must be talking about we must be leaving them out but there has to be a realistic assessment of where they are today and one has to go back and look at obviously they don't live with families and all so i think there is a strong evidence to suggest even farmer who has a land holding of less than 2 uh, acres or so is not a affluent person so if you have to look at and then this debate about whether uh, who is better off you know in the villages uh, that i go means today i was in maharashtra i was i had gone to towards panvel and all now all the land owners are talking about the amount of incentives we have for landless people 
right from subsidy and it's in the name of generational justice we are doing because for generations they were subdued for various reasons look at the people land owners kids and all they can't even afford educating their kids out so i think there has to be a balanced thing and there has to be a reality check on what's happening on those farm families and education is the answer to that everybody wants to get their kids educated so again coming back to it uh, if you look at the money that was earned by a farmer and how his or her lifestyle was 40 years ago vis a vis today it's in a pathetic shape it will pathetic would be understood hmm. no i was well, referring to the work of uh, lavish bhandari and amrish dubey who had talked their own extensive study they said there was a three things they talked about over the agricultural sector they said there's a destruction of the agriculture you know jobs and this expected to continue and agriculture yeah. employment i, I would i would request uh, professor sukpal to also respond to this question thank you uh, i think uh, uh, my take on this is that uh, given that studies findings and otherwise a uh, uh, lot of evidence around us saying that the non agriculture sectors are not able to generate new jobs therefore we need to retain people in agriculture for another maybe two decades by converting agriculture into agri business there a lot of potential there are countries i can name one of them which have generated not only employment but also higher incomes out of agriculture sector without moving people out of that we would need to do that sooner we realize that better it is we simply cannot push people out of agriculture to nowhere or into the sea so we'll have to invest in agriculture especially for small farmers more importantly workers to get more out of agriculture there no problem with viability of agriculture whether 5 acre or 1 acre you can make lot of money from agriculture plenty of money can be made but money is not in the farm money is in the market as i said earlier indirectly so so instead of others making money we should make farmers also share the kitty or partake some of it we need to invest in that and lot of agencies have accepted that fact now that's why i am saying this world bank report also saying that if we take that perspective agriculture has a much bigger role to play in india's economic development than has been the case the way we write it off saying this is a sector which has no future and many of my panelists also talking like that as if agriculture is a dying occupation no it is not we need to transform we need to regenerate agriculture by making it cost effective making it more uh, uh, sort of monetized by making it more sustainable there is plenty of scope so i have no doubt about that we need to do that it is sort of you know rhymes with what they said the last point that they said that the value chain in the agri sector that is rising exactly that's why we are having this session yeah they don't doubt right. about that we we have not paid enough attention to markets either we talk of state driven markets or we don't talk about markets that's the problem yeah our markets at a rudimentary stage so one of the answer to your as questions would be you have to have very innovative markets earlier we had markets like dood market was separate than a bhaji market obviously zamindars were running or somebody else was running it today we have we are in a stage where there is there is a modern intermediary chain i could call it a modern arthia chain that is emerging you know you want to pay 2% there you know that's my wallet you want to put there give me this money no we have to be efficient so we need to create many more markets and now we have physical markets are there now with digital power i am sure it's going to emerge and what professor sukhal singh is saying is absolutely true and i agree with mr somnath ghosh is also but i was just giving a counter evidence that it's also on the other side but the point is if we start looking at it as agri business nothing like it a new generation will do it whether we like it or not right thank you uh, mr sena uh, pivraj if i yes, may sir. just uh, ask the question i had asked about financing yes sir uh, yes. to mr jay kumar yes uh, jay are you still there uh, uh, you know my question was that there is a need for major transformation in indian agriculture because it's stuck in the dual subsidy yes. regime uh, you know subsidizing the producers and subsidizing the consumers uh my hypothesis is that uh this is not this time around this can't be financed by the indian state i mean at least not totally maybe partially so, so the question is under what circumstances will the private capital markets uh pay for this transformation 
without yeah, you know uh, the kind of issues that sukhpal uh, highlighted which is that they are only focused on maximizing their returns and uh, extracting costs both in terms of the environmental sustainability as well as the the you know wage rates and other uh, welfare of the people in the value chain i was think thinking that the uh, that you see the the couple of things one is that uh, the interest in agricultural finance has to be increased in the first instance by development of uh, specialized institutions uh, you look at people like rabo bank and others in netherland and the kind of impact they have made in india we tend to still follow the indian administrative style of functioning which is everybody can do any job so in the banking sector for example especially if we take the public sector banking system there is no concept of a specialized agricultural position you would be trained in fx today and tomorrow you will be sent to run an agricultural job because your promotion policy requires you to spend two more years in the agricultural sector so one is we need specialized institutions in this country recognizing that the sectors are getting much more nuanced and we need uh, far more specialized people in place so that's part number one and that's a generic statement with respect to a lot of things we do uh the second thing i would think uh, is uh, is becoming um, necessary is or rather is becoming um, is 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 adding impetus is this whole digitization that is happening and is affecting at the smallest level these things are getting picked up and they are going to add lot of footprints and ability to lend and lot of more efficient ways to to deal with the risk allocations as well so so i think that would be the other other factor that is coming along so development of specialized institution coupled with the fact that digital technology in its in its very different forms is enabling to understand risk manage risk and also able to finance uh, the, able to reduce the operational cost quite thoroughly so so those are some of the things that we need to look at uh, uh, bringing it down i don't know whether it answers your question but every time the operational cost keeps coming down the ability to serve the farmer increases today a lot of things we don't do because we don't get the economies of scale but maybe some of the economies of scale are getting solved by itself through digitization costs which have become very cheap so you're able to do fund transfer for 50 rupees and 20 rupees and 10 rupees through upi with practically no problem with respect to scale and cost so some of these things i hope will also work in our favor thank you uh, uh, you are if you don't mind i'd like to ask sanjeev also for a response to that question because uh, you know if indeed capital comes private capital comes it will largely come through the agri business sector <clears throat> Uh, i mean uh, so mr jay kumar of course covered uh, capital that will come through the financial institutions banks and so on but the agri business sector would also be making investments so under yeah. what conditions could that happen and uh, uh, still be favorable to the other actors in the so so, uh, so vijay i i think very straightforward uh, straightforward answer and i think uh, this is also reflective uh, at the ground level if you see the state of agriculture and uh, you know how it's operated so wherever the uh, wherever it has worked well you've seen serious uh, players investing huge amounts of money and i think one prime example is the plantations you've got all the large corporates uh, involved in you know for example sugar tea coffee uh, rubber and you know oil palm etc all the large players are there because they see a you know sensible viable business to do and capital has automatically followed we are now seeing a lot of uh, patient capital finding its way into ag businesses the way they're being set up and both technology led and uh, supply chain led and those models are emerging and some are you know we're seeing some successes and that's how the whole market evolves as well but the point i'm trying to make is that uh, you know through support of the state i mean the agriculture it's not india is not alone even the very evolved markets like uh, us and uh, you know europe uh you you know exactly well that how much subsidy and support is provided to the agriculture and especially the producers so some are driven lot by political compulsion some are driven by uh, you know in terms of they need to maintain a very strategic uh, you know view on food security and other challenges but the point i'm making is that uh, fundamentally the resource allocation we spoke uh, you spoke about fiscal deficit and the challenges around that so when the resources are less how do we optimize our resource utilization by coming out with the uh, both at the policy level and how it is implemented at the ground level that government supports uh, uh, the government supports uh, 
uh, you know, the viability gap funding, government looks at very targeted investment around, you know, futures uh, risk management. So the farmers are less exposed to the price risk if there's a premium to be paid for that. <clears throat> I think there are a lot of tools available where the government needs to look at uh, things very differently, including uh, in the MSP operations. We all know that, that you know how the procurement, uh, the inefficiencies and the issues around the procurement mechanism, which is there and how it's distributed. It has worked well because there's no alternate channel came up, but uh, there are viable ways of doing it rather than exactly the way. And I think the exploring those options and working the, the, how the capital gets deployed into viable businesses. So we will see more of it, but till the time, we have businesses making money. Uh, the government will have to chip in in terms of providing that backup or collateral or support or whatever you may call. And in case that is not there, you will find capital coming in, but very less. So till we create that structures in place for that to work well, uh, we'll see wine business, for example, all private capital is doing that. So I mean, there's a whole lot of good examples are there. And I think we need to really sort of understand each of these value chains and understand that where the government needs to chip in, where it doesn't, where the private sector needs to deploy more and how the policy can support that. I think that unfortunately uh, in India, we don't see much of that. And, you know, in a very structured and detailed way that uh, evaluation being done and, uh, you know, a very clear cut uh, policy option being given, we don't see much of that. But hopefully I think that will uh, keep on resolving and getting better. Thank you so much. Thanks. Back to you, Yuvraj. Thank you. Thank you, VM. I think we have, uh, uh, you know, gone beyond, way beyond our uh, allotted time. And uh, with this, I would uh, like to close this session and thank each of the panelists and all the participants for joining. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sukhpal, for joining from Ahmedabad and sharing your views. And uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Jay Kumar, for, for your insights. And uh, thank you, Mr. Rajesh Sinha. Although you know there was a few uh, problems with the connection, we uh, we are lucky to have you on this uh, towards the end on this uh, discussion. And lastly, uh, Mr. Sanjeev Asthana for making time and joining from all the way from Bangalore. Thank you, sir, and thank you, VM, uh, for being here all along. With this, thank I would thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you much, all, all the panelists and your brother and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks.